All right, it looks like we're now live for the pop-up. So today we're going to be talking primarily about stoicism, and I may answer some other questions or comments that have to do with, with other things, but we're going to give priority to uh, discussing stoicism in this pop-up since that's the theme. So we'll see if we can come back to other questions or things like that. I'll also mention as uh, we're getting warmed up that um, if you haven't caught the um, video or the podcast of our, our inaugural radio show, Wisdom for Life, that's hosted by myself and Dan Hayes, um, you might want to check that out. Um, we're going to be broadcasting from River West Radio uh, every other Friday, 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And uh, so, you know, we, we don't talk exclusively about Stoicism, but it is oriented towards practical philosophy and philosophy as a way of life. So if you're into that sort of thing, then you might want to check it out because uh, you can hear it not just on uh, you know, in, here in Milwaukee, but, you know, since we have the Internet, you can hear it pretty much anywhere in the world. All right, so let's see what we've got here. Um, uh, I'm going to skip over the Chesterton question, save that for an AMA or for one of the other ones. Um, let's see, Matthew Hopkins, unraveling layers of self-delusion and not getting in your own way seems to me the greatest psychological task for the Stoic, perhaps a life's work. I'd love to know if you see this as a valid idea. I actually have two ideas there, right? Um, unlayering, unraveling layers of self-delusion and not getting in your own way or not constituting an impediment to yourself. Two different things that are quite important to Stoic philosophy. Yeah, I would say that those are among it. The, the, certainly, Stoic philosophy is not reducible to those two motifs, but it is those are those are important, um, and you know we can speak more broadly of virtue ethics in general. So it's not just a Stoic thing, or uh, you know an Aristotelian thing, or Platonic thing. Um, and we can also talk about um, religious traditions as well. You know, if you look at Christian thought, you look at Buddhist thought, you look at Hindu thought, you look at uh, a lot of uh, thoughtful people belonging to particular wisdom traditions, figuring out who you are and how you've got who you are wrong is really quite central to things. And so, yeah, that, you know, you can think of wisdom traditions or philosophical traditions as offering us ways to analyze ourselves progressively. Cause it's never like we get, get it, you know, it all figured out just in, in one big flash we, you know, chip away at it. We figure out what's wrong with it over time. Um, Bruce says, hello, Dr. Saylor. I'm happy to see Bruce here, as, as always. Um, so let's see what else we've got. Uh, Namaskam EHT, uh, Marcus Aurelius and Executing Christians, and I talked about much. And Peter Aram responds, Donald Robertson debunks the myth of Marcus Aurelius executing Christians. Yeah, Donald Donald debunks that, so did quite a few. Um, Aurelius did, in fact, have some Christians executed, but uh, it wasn't, you know, some massive pogrom or something like that. They weren't really that much on his radar. Um, I mean, they, they were a group among many, right? Uh, and, and, you know, if you look at Justin Martyr's apology, it's, it's addressed to the Roman emperor uh, specifically, you know, because he thinks that Christians are being persecuted. But, you know, we have to be careful when we use this word persecution. Does it mean like throwing people in, you know, into the circus and having lions tear them apart, which um, is a rather dramatic thing? Or does it mean, uh, you know, bringing coercive pressure to bear on them? Um, and, you know, Aurelius was a Roman emperor. He's, he's primarily concerned with uh, maintaining some sort of social order. The Christians and, you know, also Jews were uh, quite disruptive within the Roman Empire in some respects. Um, all right, so let's, let's see what else we have here about Stoicism. Brittany Page, can you please talk about pan- 
pantheism and stoicism. Um, so, so pantheism is the idea that everything is God, right? And you could say that the stoic physics is pantheistic. Um, it's probably better to describe it as panentheistic, which means that uh, typically when we use this term in religious studies or in philosophy of religion, we're instead of saying that everything is part of you know one giant organism that is God um, or mechanism or whatever we want to say, um, we say that there is there is still some sort of hierarchy there. So, you know, when you say that everything is God it sounds like everything is kind of leveled out. And the Stoics think that the human being is quite literally, you know, or at least a part of the human being. And by the way, it's not just the Stoics who think this. You know, Platonists, Aristotelians have similar conceptions, is, is sort of like a piece of, of God or a spark of God or a reflection of the divine. And that part of us is the rational part, right? So it's not, it's not just our body or our animality or, or something like that. Um, and so, you know, you, you look at Epictetus and he'll, he'll draw some conclusions from this. He'll say that a uh, slave that you're treating badly, they're also, you know, a child of God, just like you. And uh, he'll also say, you probably shouldn't go off to the whorehouse because when you do, you're mixing God in with, with prostitutes and all of that sort of stuff. So there's the Stoics are not, pantheistic in the sense of like leveling all distinctions and just saying, well, everything is, is a, a piece or function of God, um, capital G God, Zeus, right? Um, they have, you know, God is the conception of the, this entire universe or the divine reason running through it. And then they have um, all sorts of lowercase g gods and, you know, we don't know that much about their, their theology as we'd like to because a lot of the texts, but probably the place for that is this rose on the nature of God's book too, where, where it's discussed. And also on divination where, where things like that are being discussed as well to, to a lesser extent. Um, but, you know, modern Stoicism, it's that, that stuff really isn't that important. There are some people who are, are quite committed to that. They call themselves traditional Stoics, and they say that all the other modern Stoics are, you know, uh, misguided. But I'd say most modern Stoics actually think that we can dispense with the, the Stoic theology. Um, all right, let's see what else we got uh, for Stoic questions. Uh, even Nanaj, is Stoicism relevant in reading Hegel? Um, what philosophers are important to understand him? No, Stoicism isn't particularly important for reading Hegel. Hegel does talk about the Stoics, but doesn't appear to have understood them particularly well. Um, and in, in the you know, lectures on the history of philosophy, says that we we can't really be Stoics or Epicureans or any of the or skeptics of, of the, the old sort uh, in the present. And the present for him is, remember, a good uh, 100 and what, 180, 190 years ago? No, actually two, more than 200 years ago now. Now we're in 2020, right? Um, what other philosophers are relevant to reading Hegel? Um, you know, everyone mentioned Kant, of course, but... Rousseau, uh, quite important as well. Um, you probably need to know a good bit about modern philosophy in general. You you want to know a good bit about Plato and Aristotle. Um, so, you know, you, I, I read around pretty widely. Um, and also remember, too, that it's not just reading philosophers to understand Hegel, but, but um, you know, philosophy is for Hegel is something broader than just what we, what we consider philosophy in the narrow sense today. Um, I'm going to take a question from Andre uh, and I'm going to twist it in a stoic way. Do I recommend any books or authors for learning how to think clearly or even real life exercises for that? There's nothing better than making distinctions and practicing making distinctions. When you see people in an argument about something, ask yourself, are they actually arguing about the same thing, you know, or are they arguing past each other? That's something that 
philosophers when they're they're doing a good job um, really bring to the table. And you know, studying Stoic philosophy will will help with that quite a bit because you'll see them doing that. There's nothing like actually reading philosophical texts in which people are doing that sort of work. And there's really nothing like grappling with um, philosophical texts that are outside of your comfort zone. So they're not written like an academic article that you might find in uh, analytic philosophy of, of the present or not written like, you know, the cutting edge continental stuff that you're used to. Um, there's nothing like that to push you out of your intellectual comfort zone and, and help you attend to what argument looks like. And you could say a similar thing. You're going to hear the dog drinking over there for a little while. You can say a similar thing with, you know, like studying uh, movements in Chinese philosophy, you know, or studying Aristotle or, um, you know, reading Platonic dialogues and not just like tr trying to say, okay, what's the, what's the argument here? What's the heart of it? But actually reading the whole dialogue and then comparing it with other dialogues. Doing that sort of work is going to make you a better thinker um, because you're, you're in effect working out in the intellectual gym. All right. Um, metamorphosis. Do I think a Stoic has on them the burden of explaining why life, why life is worth taking seriously in order to convince a cynic or hedonist to reconsider their position? I don't think a Stoic has a burden of uh, explaining anything to anybody. Um, that's not inherent in, in the philosophy as such. If they want to, they can, but you know, it's not as if we, we have an absolute requirement to like, oh, you've embraced this particular philosophical position. You, you must defend it against all comers and explain yourself to anybody who asks. And uh, no, that, that, that's not the case. Um, very often in philosophy, people aren't, you know, they've, they've got their pet position and they, they're, they're not receptive at a particular point in time. And when they are receptive, then you can explain things to them. I mean, you could say the same thing about, um, should we try, you know, if you, if you like Descartes, should we try to, you know, explain why Descartes is, is the best philosopher, you know, if we like Aristotle. Um, and it's not as if Epicureans or, or cynics or hedonists, um, don't think life is worth taking seriously. They just, have a different way of approaching it. You know, hedonists think that we should try to maximize our pleasure and reduce pain, whether they're, if we're talking about ancient philosophy, whether they're an Aristippian hedonist or an Epicurean hedonist, they were just as serious as the Stoics were. And the cynics were too. They called themselves heralds of God. They were thinking that they were there to not just, you know, masturbate in the marketplace or show everybody what a you know cool, detached person they were. That's only, you know, a portion of what cynics did. They were actually trying to show that virtue was the the only good and to do so by haranguing their fellow citizens and, and doing, you know, all sorts of crazy modeling stuff. So yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, philo philosophy and critical thinking. Gender feminist theorists often include stoicism in their definition of toxic traditional masculinity. Not my view. Just wondering what your response is to this treatment of stoicism. Um, some do and some don't. And to the degree that they, they do, they're either talking about stoicism. And I notice that you, you're using lowercase s, uh, stoicism, which already, you know, is not stoicism. Um, the stoicism that we're talking about, uppercase S, the philosophy. And so I think it's, it's kind of a, a common uh, set of uh, mix-ups and, and mistakes. Here comes sassy cat wanting to get in my lap. Uh, 17 years old, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't care about online events or things like that. All right, so there are a lot of guys out there who really are, you know, toxic as, as human beings, and they have all sorts of stupid and misguided conceptions of masculinity. And they do, in fact, um, bring up the, so the Stoics and uh, try to use them as talking points, and usually they don't know what they're talking about. We call that broicism, right? We have a name for that in the, the modern Stoic movement because there's so many, you know, dude bros out there doing that. 
and uh, talking all sorts of crazy stuff about, you know, usually they're also super fans of the Spartans, but they, they don't know anything about the Spartans, quite frankly. They, the more they, they're drawing on like watching the 300 or something like that. And uh, so, you know, to the degree that that's what's in the crosshairs of uh, um, gender feminist theorists, they're actually right. <laughs> If that's what stoicism means, then then stoicism is toxic and and quite frankly is garbage. And when I run into guys like that, um, you know, I I feel kind of uh, it's a shame that they're doing that to themselves because they're usually never happy individuals, even when they manage to dominate people, and they misunderstand the doctrine that they want to claim. You know, I but you know you can say the same thing about Nietzscheans, right? There's plenty of guys out there who want to be uber mention and, and you know, they're, they're not, <laughs> but they, they use a little bit of thought. Now, when it comes to actual stoicism, what the, the actual stoics taught and what people in the present who are well informed by stoic philosophy put into practice. Yeah. Then the gender theorists are wrong. Um, because you know, it, it's, it's not going to be about the things that we call toxic masculinity. And I'll go on record too, by the way, and say, um, I think there is such a thing as toxic masculinity. I've seen it many times. Um, there, there's plenty of it out there. You know, it exists today. It existed when I was a kid. Um, I, you know, have fallen into it at various times, you know, particularly when I was younger and I thankfully was able to get my way out of it. Um, and I'm a much happier person for not that. But, you know, stoicism as an actual philosophy say, well, that's all garbage. That's damaging to you. Um, so, you know, that's probably a sufficient answer to that. Um, coffee smug. Here's a good question. Who is my favorite contemporary stoic? Um, Christopher Gill, I would say. And I, I would say that in part because um, I really like Chris's writings and I've met him and, you know, actually had the chance to hang out with him from time to time. And he's sort of the elder statesman of the modern Stoic movement and the modern Stoicism organization. Um, and he's an all around good guy. Um, he uh, is very thoughtful and uh, I enjoy hanging out with him when I get to. It's kind of, you know, like hanging out with a rock star. Uh, and I love uh, the stuff that, that he writes. I mean, I also really do like A.A. Long. Um, Long doesn't identify strictly as a Stoic, um, but I really do like his stuff. He's also cool when I got to meet him. Um, you know, there, there's quite a few people that kind of fit that bill. Margaret Graver, uh, Julia Anas, um, and then there's a whole, you know, crop of other people as well. So, all right. Um, what else have we got about Stoicism? Uh, here we go. Matthew Hopkins, I understand Epictetus Seneca and Marcus Aurelius are late period Stoics. Can you recommend any earlier writers beyond Zeno's fragments? Um, yeah, I mean, here's, here's one thing to say to begin with. You actually get a lot of the earlier writers through Seneca, uh, and to a lesser extent, through Epictetus, because they they actually provide us with fragments of what these people taught. Um, but all the other earlier Stoics that we have are indeed fragmentary. I mean, we have a little bit of Epictetus's teacher, Musonius Rufus, as well, and we do have um, you know a, another contemporary author, Heracles, um, his writings. Um, but for the most part, what we've got is going to be coming from. Uh, sources about the Stoics rather than from Stoics. And, you know, it's, I think a lot of people fall into the misconception of thinking that, oh man, you know, it, it's important to get closer to the source, closer to the origin point. It's just not that way in philosophy. Um, Epictetus is just as good of a Stoic as Zeno was, as Chrysippus was, as Diogenes of Babylon was, you know, or Posidonius was. Um, Posidonius, by the way, you know, was criticized as not being an Orthodox Stoic by the Orthodox Stoics of his time, but he was the more interesting and innovative Stoic. 
Um, and you can say the same thing about Seneca, same thing about Marcus Aurelius. They're, um, it's not as if there's anything bad about being later. Now, if you want to read um, what we've got of uh, earlier authors, you need to go to um, people who are talking about them or providing the fragments. So Cicero's a big one. Plutarch, who's kind of hostile to the Stoics, is another. Um, Galen talks about Chrysippus. Mainly, you know, he thinks Chrysippus has got things wrong, but he tells us what Chrysippus had to say. Diogenes Laertes, of course, has the entire, you know, book seven devoted to the Stoics. Uh, Arius Didymus has um, the epitome of Stoic ethics, um, which is kind of dry, uh, but worth reading. So those, those are all, you know, places you can go. Um, you're not going to find, I mean, you will find books out there that purport to be, here's Zeno, but it's really just collating the fragments that we have of Zeno and saying, well, here you go. Um, and there is a book out there similarly called The Philosophy of Chrysippus that I, I think is doing the same sort of thing. All right. Um, John, cynics embodied the true Socratic philosophy. Prove me wrong. Um, I don't need to prove you wrong. I mean, you want to think that cynics embodied the true uh, Socratic philosophy? I guess you're a cynic. I don't think that's the case. I think that, you know, there's a pluralism of uh, Socratic philosophies. There's Platonism. There's the Megarian school. Um, you know, the Stoics are, in effect, a Socratic school. Cicero recognized that the Aristotelians are a Socratic school. But, hey, you want to think that the Cynics are the only game in town? You go right on ahead because you just basically ended the conversation right there. Um, that's not the way to try to hold a, a philosophical conversation. Um, let's see here. Chad Maples. Is it true that there is a relationship between Stoicism and Judaism? On the whole, no. Um, but in parts, yes. Because different movements within Judaism were, of course, influenced by the Greek culture that dominated the, um, the uh, Near East because of the conquests of Alexander and the successor states and stuff like that. And, you know, the, the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, thinkers and, and movements were also influenced to a considerable extent by the Persians and by, by others as well. So, you know, it, it's not as if, it's not as if there's something out there that's, that's, you know, capital J, J Judaism that was influenced, but there's plenty of, of movements. And, um, you know, you can, if you read the, the books of the Maccabees, for example, um, the first two of which are considered to be canonical for all of the earlier churches. Um, it's only, it's only, uh, later on with, with, um, uh, the Protestants that, that people don't consider them to be canonical. Uh, you're going to find a lot of stoic uh, actions. And by the time that you get to fourth Maccabees, which is not considered canonical, um, but was, you know, clearly read by people because, you know, they thought it was an important text um, in some groups. There's a lot of Stoicism there. But you can also find a lot of uh, Platonism. I mean, look at the Book of Wisdom, you know, the Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, again, you know, uh, canonical for, for Catholics, Orthodox, Eastern uh, Christians, um, just not, or, just not uh, canonical for, for most Protestants. Um, that's pretty influenced by, by Neoplatonism. And so, yeah, you'll find some things like that. And then, you know, it'd be interesting to think about what would be the case if Stoicism had survived longer in, as its own school rather than as something that essentially got sucked into, just like Aristotelianism got into Neoplatonism in, in many cases. Um, all right, let's see what else we got here. Um, let's see. Um, oh, just jumped a little bit. Let's see if we can find, uh, Chad Maples asks Massimo thoughts. I like Massimo. He's a colleague of mine. Um, we don't always agree on everything, but we don't have to, um, and uh, I interact with him, you know, fairly frequently, uh, usually face-to-face -face at least once a year. 
And, you know, he and I actually went through philosophical counseling training and certification together um, back in, was it 2014, I think it was, um, down in New York uh, City. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're colleagues. We, we correspond from time to time. Um, we, you know, because we're both out there, I think he's in a much more, he's got a much bigger digital footprint than I do, but we, we, uh, sometimes compare notes about how we handle trolls or, um, you know, uh, when we, when we, uh, move ourselves out of a conversation when a conversation is not particularly useful. And we've, we've swapped ideas about like how to do public philosophy events. So, and you know, it, it, I like his book. Uh, I did a review of it, how to be a stoic. Um, I don't, you know, there's things where I don't agree with him completely or with uh, Peter Stankiewicz, who's also, you know, a good colleague of mine. I think they are, I think that, that living in accordance with nature is a more complicated thing than they think it is. Um, but you know, those are sort of variances within, uh, the same kind of movement. Um, all right. Thomas Moore, best stuff to read on mortality. Well, if you're talking about Stoics, classic Stoics, right? Seneca has a lot to say about that. Um, you know, and, and so a lot of people start with their Seneca reading the letters to Lucilius, or sometimes they're called the moral epistles and it's a big, thick book, right? But he's also got these consolations that are worth checking out um, because some of those are consolations when somebody's kid has died, right? And so there, there's some reflections on death. Epictetus has some good stuff to say about that, um, you know, running throughout the discourses and the Enchiridion. Marcus Aurelius, of course has quite a few, you know, great passages about that. And he's writing, you know, as an older person um, with Epictetus. Epictetus, of course, didn't write these things down. His, uh, his biographer Arian did. Um, and that was presumably earlier in Epictetus's tenure as a teacher. He lived quite long, too. Then again, Seneca's stuff, he's writing it. You know, he's, he's fairly old when he's writing, too. So, you know, they're all approaching mortality. Uh, so that, that's, that's good. Um, all right. Um, Chad Maples, Greg was Socrates really just the best sophist. No, I mean, that's, you know, it's funny. I, I, I do sometimes get people when they read uh, Republic book one, they're like, Socrates is just, you know, shutting Thrasymachus up and he's not, he doesn't really have any good arguments. And that's wrong to begin with. There are some good arguments in there, but he doesn't usually waste his good arguments on people who can't appreciate him. There's, you know, the dramatic context counts in Platonic dialogues. And I don't know how anyone would get the idea that Socrates is just a, another sophist in widely reading Platonic dialogues or even Xenophon's dialogues, you know? Um, Xenophon is another witness to what Socrates was like. Um, now, does that mean that he's diametrically opposed to the sophists on every point? No, in part because the sophists were not all one group that were all on one single page, too. You know, Protagoras is different than Gorgias, is different than Thrasymachus, and they each have their own uh, way of, of doing things. They're different than Hippias as well. So, yeah. All right, Matt Henderson, any suggestions on Stoic philosophy or philosophers that can help with self-discipline when it comes to schoolwork, <laughs> philosophy major? Um, you know, the same, again, the same Stoics that we have, uh, Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. I will say this, you, you, you don't have to feel like you have to read everybody, um, you know, I, I, the person I prefer the most is Epictetus. You know, I like Aurelius, but I, I think he's kind of like all over the map. And I, I, you know, I think that, um, Seneca is kind of, I, I enjoy reading him, but I don't enjoy reading him like I do Epictetus. And, um, maybe there, maybe there's some temperament involved. So when you're reading this stuff, you don't always have to like try to, as we say, boil the ocean. Right. Um, I think it's less about reading things and more about actually practicing. So, you know, it could be helpful to remind yourself of certain passages, like where Epictetus, for example, says, okay, you know, 
uh, consider what you're getting into. If you're going to try to, you know, develop discipline, you're, it's like becoming a wrestler. You're going to get sand thrown in your eyes. You're going to get thrown down. You have to get back up. So if you, if you have that, like in the back of your mind, when you encounter difficulties and fail, then you can say, well, okay, what would Epictetus say about this? Now, now I can put that into practice, but the putting it into practice, that's the key thing, right? Uh, discipline is something that develops over time by making yourself do things that you are not inclined to do, <laughs> running the extra mile or, you know, putting it like in my case, um, going through and grading all of these student papers without taking a break to look at Twitter, you know, or, or, you know, uh, get up and have a, a, a sandwich or something like that. Right. Buckling down and sticking with it. Um, there's, there's no substitute for that. You might benefit though, from thinking by carrying out a sort of analysis and thinking about, well, why don't you stick to something? What's going on in you that tempts you to abandon, um, the task that you would like to persevere in. So that, you know, that can be, uh, helpful, I think. Um, all right. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, All right. Um, Brittany Page, what are your arguments on, what are your thoughts on Seneca's argument against forgiveness and for mercy, doing an independent study on it? Um, are you talking about in, on clemency? Um, Seneca actually does think you should forgive in a lot of cases, um, and you should show mercy, and he provides a whole bunch of different considerations, so I'm not sure which, which one you have in mind. I will say that, it, I mean, it's kind of cool that you do see the, there's, there's often this take of like, oh, you know, the Greek pagans, they, they understood some things, but Christianity had to come along and clarify all these other things that the Greeks had no idea about, like, you know, how good forgiveness was. And you're like, what? I mean, it, it's there in Plato. Aristotle discusses it. The Stoics discuss it. You know, where is this, this need to, you know, uh, put things down like that coming from. I mean, Seneca is, is, is it, you know, it's another thing to think about too. Seneca is also living in a time when um, for generations, the incapacity to, uh, to let grudges and factional strife go had torn Rome apart and then replaced um, the dysfunctional military tribunes and councils and Senate with, well, the Senate was still there, but it be, fortunately became, you know, sort of um, defanged uh, with, with an emperor, you know, an, an, an imperial structure, which if you got the wrong person and could really go off the rails and Seneca is writing um, some of these works to Nero before Nero revealed himself as the screw up that he was. So that I think that might be helpful to uh, think about as as well. Um, all right, let's see what else we've got here. Um, I just skipped a little bit. Uh, Andre asks, uh, "Can I clarify the concept of apatheia?" Tried to apply the wisdom of Seneca's letters and mortify the passions, but later felt that I needed those passions as fuel for, to life. Well, the Stoics don't say that you should actually not have any passions. Um, you know, you you probably want to read Seneca more closely in the discussions of the emotions, and again, you want to look at Diogenes Laertes and uh, Cicero. Also talks about this in in Tusculan Meditations. <laughs> disputation, sorry. And um, uh, uh, Arius Didymus, right, uh, in his epitome, the Stoics thought that the goal was not to repress emotion, but rather to transform it. So mortifying the passions, uh, depending on how you're doing it, may or may not be a, a viable strategy. Just shoving everything down inside or saying it doesn't doesn't affect me when it does affect you, 
that's not going to work. You actually have to understand why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And then you can start working away at it and saying, okay, am I making the right assumptions here or judgments or is what I'm doing off base? Um, do I want to feel like this? You know, apatheia is not a emotionless state. It's a lack of the pathe. It's not a lack of the eupatheia, uh, the good emotions, which include love, you know, um, which include affection. And, you know, there's all sorts of good discussions of these, again, in, in Arius Didymus's um, epitome of Stoic ethics. Um now, the passions is fuel to life. There is one thing that you do want to keep in, in mind. So from, from the Stoic point of view, Seneca talks about this in On Anger, right? The Aristotelians would say, oh, you need, you need anger in order to like get the right thing done. So you get angry at injustice, now that gets you ready to go march and fight against the unjust tyrant. And Seneca says, um, can't you accomplish that with, with reason instead of the passion of anger. And if you can't, if you need anger as like a crutch like that, it's kind of unreliable and it often goes in the wrong direction. Um, maybe you need to be strengthening your reason, your faculty of reason, so you can actually get yourself to do the right thing without having to get all riled up with it. And it's really interesting. This is something I've been thinking about and I'm going to do some writing on. There's so many people when you respond to them critically and you say, no, nah, you've got that wrong or uh, you probably shouldn't have said that. They're like, why are you so angry with me? And you're like, buddy, I'm not angry with you. I'm just saying that you've actually got this wrong and you're you're spouting nonsense or something like that. Or you probably shouldn't be weighing in on you know somebody else's sites with your, your BS, right? And you can say that without getting angry with somebody. You can just call a spade a spade. You can say <clears throat> somebody... Um, is screwing up and 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 just leave it at that, right? So, um, all right. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, ah, here's a good here's a good thing uh, from Matthew. So Cobbleston, he means Friedrich Cobbleston with a history of philosophy, came, claims Stoicism came about as the Hellenistic world became part of the Roman Empire. Um, yeah, so that's true, um, but it didn't actually happen at that point in time. Stoicism is is around before the Romans have like gobbled up all of the the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, right? Um, so, and Stoicism makes its way to Rome. Otherwise, you couldn't have had Diogenes of Babylon being one of the three ambassadors of the philosophical schools going to Rome and getting Cato the Elder to say, uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't trust these these Greek philosophers. So, you know, the other thing that Cobbleston buys into that, you see very often in treatments of Hellenistic philosophy, um, really from about the early 1800s on to, I would say the 19, it was a common view until about the 1970s. And now, now you know, more attentive reading and, and you know, less ideological uh, uh, interpretations you know, said, ah, that's, that's not, not true. So there's this, this story, right. That the Greek city state was the most absolutely important thing in Greek democracy and all this sort of stuff. And ignoring the fact that most Greek city states were pushed around by other Greek city states and forced into the leagues and they were interdependent and all this, this stuff long before the Macedonian conquest. But there's this, you know, sort of story like, well, Philip of Macedon united Greece and then freedom went out the window. It became meaningless. And the Greek city-state could no longer be the locus of things. So people turned inward. They became individualistic. I mean, all you got to do is read Plato's dialogues. and you're like, the individual is all, Individualists all over the place or read Thucydides, right? Um, and, and you'd be disabused of that. But the idea was that, that Stoicism, Skepticism, and Epicureanism are in some way less philosophical they're they're kind of defective they're they're only really interested in in ethical responses to the problem of what do we do now right 
And they are actually responses to what do we do now? Um, but the Aristotelians and the Platonists were also doing that at the same time. And the what do we do now could cover a lot of different things. Cobbleston's treatment of the Stoics is adequate. It's not great. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't rely on it too heavily. Um, I think he's he's better on some some thinkers than he is on others. All right, John, how would you compare Nietzsche's criticisms of Stoicism and his will to power compared to Stoicism for finding fulfillment out of life? Yeah, I mean, Nietzsche's criticisms of Stoicism aren't really that um, that on point. Um, he criticizes them for stoicizing nature. He has a different conception of nature. This is one of those sort of things where, you know, when you're deciding which way you're going to go, you can go this way or you go this way, but you can't go both. And Nietzsche's going this way and then criticizing the Stoics for not having gone that way. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's, uh, um, perfectly fine. You know, at some points you can't make everything compatible. Um, I think that Nietzsche's criticisms of some, how some people have used stoicism are not bad. You know, I think those could be on point. I've seen plenty of people in the stoic uh, forums act like Rosantamont filled jerks to each other, but then they're not really being stoics, right? They're not living up to the stoicism. Um, and, you know, again, they're two very different conceptions of things. Nietzsche doesn't think that there's – Nietzsche's ultimately a pluralist uh, when it comes down to whatever the ontology is. There's will to power, but will to power takes all these different shapes and forms. And, you know, one thing where you can say that they have something in common, they realize that the human being is a screwed up creature, and it's it's – screwed up in part because it's various drives and uh, ideas and all these different things jumbled around inside of it that, that have material correlates, but are, we can also understand in, in not strictly material ways that these are in conflict and contradiction with each other. As a matter of fact, Epictetus uses the word mache. They are at war with each other. Um, and part of the goal is to figure out what we want to give priority over what. And that's where Nietzsche and the Stoics have different answers. Um, well, it's getting dark now. You can see the light is, is changing as, as the sun goes down. So, yeah, that's, that's probably enough of an answer to that. Um, all right. Let's see here. Um, Peter Aram, if there's time, could you comment on the, the connection between the social virtue of justice and the modern idea of social justice? Yeah, if you're a Stoic, you're actually for social justice. And social justice, um, you know, it, it emerges in the as a, as a word in the uh, 19th century. John Stuart Mill uses it. Uh, you'll find him talking about it. Of course, it plays a role in... in uh, um, uh, socialist and Marxist and other, other, you know, uh, thought on, on the left. Um, and it, um, it gets used by, by other people as well. And it also has important, uh, uses within Catholic thought. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we have, hear this word social justice, we want to ask, okay, what is sort of like almost McIntyre, who's justice, which rationality, which social justice are we talking about? Are we talking about um, some book, you know, some some uh, uh, hobgoblin or uh, what's what's the word that I was thinking of? Um, something, you know, the, the monster that that hides under your bed, uh, bugaboo, right? Of um, conservatives, where they're like, social justice warriors are ruining everything, and they don't know what the hell they're talking about most of the time. Um, you know, the people who, who are being tarred as social justice warriors usually don't have much of an interest in actual social justice. They're interested in some sort of, you know, reimposition of power on somebody else or reversing things. Um, but, you know, if, if we think about um, what social justice means, it means that that part of justice that has to do with the way society is organized. And something could be, you know, I was talking about this with my, my wife just the other day, right? We think about healthcare. And, you know, one of the things in this election that's being talked about is universal health care. 
And it should be because that's something that should be provided to citizens um, in, in the, you know, as much wealth as we're generating in our economy, we can afford it. And we can certainly take money away from bullshit wars and stuff like that and all the pissed away money uh, that we spend on the military. And I say that as a vet, as somebody who's, who's served and supported the military, um, and, and most vets would actually say the military gets too much money and it, it spends it poorly. Um, we should be spending it on other priorities. So, you know, you think about um, we're now framing it as Medicare for all, right? Um, why is that such an important thing? Because uh, so many people are without adequate health care, or if they do have insurance, it's ex extraordinarily expensive. It keeps them from being able to participate in American life in important ways because it sucks up so much money and so much time, and it's so arbitrary. And there are people who are you know, rationing their insulin. And if that sort of thing doesn't bother you because you've you know, got some, some ideological jag going on, you're, you're a bad person. I mean, if, if you don't care about your fellow human beings suffering uh, en masse in that way, there's, there's something deeply flawed, you know? I mean, you could say, well, the money gets spent badly. Yeah, that's, that's a quibble. Then you, you, you fix that, right? So, you know, Medicare for all is a social justice issue. Was it necessarily so 40 years ago? No, because our healthcare system was not as screwed up back then. Things change over time. And so we have to be attentive to what needs to be done. Um, so, you know, now it should, it should actually be a priority. And, you know, um, anybody who's, who's saying, oh, it, you know, you cost too much or buying into those things or take away individual freedom, most of that is lies. And, and it, shame on those people for buying into and repeating and believing those lies because truth is a value, you know. Um, and if it can be done in other countries, like as it is being done in other countries, it can be done here. It's just we lack the political will to do so. And an a easy way of saying that is we lack the will for social justice. And there's many other issues as well. Anti-racism. Um, you know, society, at least American society, and you can talk about other societies in other ways, there is structural racism. That's not a, a uh, made-up thing. And if you're a stoic and you care about justice, you should care about that because there's two sides to justice, as Cicero explains, right? There's like fairness and following the rules and fulfilling commitments and stuff like that. That would, you know, argue against racism. And then there's benevolence, which is another part of justice, doing good to people um, and, and going beyond just what the rules require. So, I mean, for me, this is kind of a no, no brainer. If you're actually a stoic and you want to live in accordance with what stoics taught, you would be for social justice. You might not be for what, what, you know, people at Evergreen College are calling it, but they're a tiny little fringe, you know, for the most part, social justice is, you know, what you're doing with your neighbor, how you're living in your community, where the tax money is going, where the priorities are, if the schools are being funded, you know, if uh, the communities are being made safe but not being terrorized by police. All those, all those things fit in there, and a stoic would be for those things. Um, all right. A lot of talk about that. Dazine Bellin, that's, uh, that, that's uh, Bruce asking, who or how did philosophical counseling start? So that's a good question. And if we want to talk about a recognized profession that we call philosophical counseling, it's, it's fairly recent. So it's, you know, a couple decades old. Um, in Europe, where it was done a little bit earlier, it's called philosophical practice. Um, but it's really the same thing. You're using resources from philosophy to understand and, and work on um, common life problems and organizational problems and oftentimes, you know, like looking at the emotions or things like that. Um, now, I said it's a really good question because that's what the ancient Platonists, Aristotelians, Stoics, Epicureans, even the skeptics, cynics, that's what they were doing. They were engaged in philosophical counseling. They just didn't call it that. They called it practicing philosophy. We got to the point with, because the academic philosophy essentially took over philosophy, um, in, and, and really only in the last 200 years. Um, it's a really recent phenomenon. Descartes, if you look at what he's doing in his works, 
he's doing philosophical counseling as well, right? He's doing philosophy as a way of life. He's not doing merely academic philosophy. Um, and I think you can say the same thing about David Hume as well. Um, definitely Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> so philosophical counseling as the phenomena that it is, it's been with us for a very long time. And it's not just in Western philosophy. It's also in all sorts of uh, non-Western philosophies as well. And you can find overlaps with religion and other disciplines too. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, Bella Vida, did a single person on earth actually practice stoicism? Yep. Plenty of people have practiced stoicism. As a matter of fact, I would say at this point, you know, if, if not uh, millions, hundreds of thousands. Now, how much? It depends on the person, right? Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, I think, tens of thousands at least of pe people right now practicing it today. So, sure. Um, all right. <laughs> Chad says, we have so many distractions, so it's difficult to keep it Greek, modern tech and entertainment. Well, that's 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 an interesting thing to say. The Greeks didn't keep it Greek in ancient times either. Um, philosophy was always a minority practice, right? And most people were, were distracted by other kinds of uh, tech and entertainment. Um just read juvenile satires and, and that will get home to you what ancient Rome was like, you know, all the different things going on. But, you know, you could read Seneca or you could read Plato or you could read Plutarch or whoever. And they're, they're all saying over and over again, century after century, man, people really have the wrong priorities. I mean, that's, that's what got Socrates into his job, right? Uh, if you want to call it a job, um, that reminds me, actually, of, of a line from Louis Ferdinand Céline's uh, Voyage au bout de la nuit. Uh, cette métier de, de s'être tué, this, this uh, job of getting yourself killed. He talked about the First World War uh, like that. Um, I'm not exactly, it was a voyage, uh, what is it? Journey to the End of Night is the English translation, right? Um, I mean, Socrates was going around to all of his fellow citizens and saying, man, your priorities are screwed up. You're spending all this time on like, you know, trying to get prestige or enjoy yourself with this sort of stuff. Focus on your soul, man. So it, it's not a, a recent phenomena. It's, it's, it's there and it's probably always going to be with us, I imagine, right? Um, okay, let's see here. Um... Oh, here's a good one from Bella Vida. How does ancient Greek Stoicism differ from self-discipline within the various Buddhist and Christian traditions? Um, there's a lot of overlap, actually. And, oh, you know, that, that's where you can draw some nice comparisons. Um, I would say that the metaphysics are different, right? And they're different. So the thing about Buddhism and the notion of emptiness um, and the there were some minority Buddhists who actually thought there was a self. But the the majority view that went out was there is there is no self. Well, Stoics think it's a self, right? So that's a there's a fundamental difference there. But it's a self that doesn't survive physical death. Uh, Seneca is a little cagey about this, but for the most part, it doesn't. That's different than the Christians who think that there is a immortal soul, right? And then we can talk about how the how the gods or whatever we want to call it. I mean, some people say, oh, Buddhism doesn't have gods. Yeah, it does. I mean, just take a look at Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism, and there's plenty of deities, right? And people are doing things with them and praying to them, and they played an important role. Um, but, you know, how, how do these things function? Do we interact with them? Um, I mean, Stoics, for example, wouldn't bother praying. There's no point, right? Um whereas Christians do. And by the way, so do, so do a lot of Buddhists, you know, just go to a pure land temple sometime and see people uh, chanting. 
and ask them what they're chanting and why they're chanting. So there, there's some some important differences there. Um, how do they differ from self-discipline? So discipline, that's where it gets really interesting. A lot of the same techniques can be found and used within these different traditions. And even the Epicureans kind of get in on this too, right? Um, or or other other traditions and other religions do too. Hinduism has has a, a you know, lot of different disciplinary practices. Um, Sufi interpretations of Islam, and there are some very you know long, deep root Sufi schools that have developed a lot of interesting uh, what, what Foucault later calls technologies of the soul or te technologies of the self, right? Um, there's a lot of those, and, and you can borrow them from each other. I, I think that, you know, Christian monasticism, which is full of, of you know, techniques and, and practices, um, you know, you look at John Cassian, I think there's some stuff that's drawn from Stoicism in there, um, or at least compatible with it. So, yeah. All right, let's see uh, what else we got here. Um, I just jumped again. See if we got some stoic things. Um, okay, so... Kujam says, what is the purpose of passion then but to fuel logical reason? The presumption is that emotions are to be denied or suppressed in order for logic to blossom. Maybe passion fuels correct reason. So, so your idea is that you would use passion to make yourself more rational. Um, I don't think a Stoic would really agree with that, um, but maybe I'm misunderstanding you there. Um, Lyndon asks, how does your Stoic side treat your former Nietzschean prolectivities? Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that they're all totally gone, right? And um, so, you know, if you think about anger as, as something that Nietzsche was probably, you know, pretty bullish about, you can say, right? Um, or at least aggressivity. Um, from a Stoic perspective, you want, you know, you want to, you want to figure out why you're you're upset to begin with and then start chipping away at that stuff. I would say that, you know, I was talking with, with somebody about this today um, that I, I think that there's, there's, you know, there's quite a few things to Nietzsche that are kind of cool and useful. And um, he is right about some things, but I think the, the overall project is something I don't, I don't really have that much sympathy with anymore. Um, there is a danger of nihilism. There is, there is, you know, a danger of, uh, falling into the, uh, you know, um, transvaluation of values, um, which I do think is something that, that, that can be understood as particularly modern and applies just as much to conservatives as it does to, to liberals or, or leftists or anything like that. There's so many different ways of being a, a phony from Nietzsche's perspective. Um, I think a lot of that's, that's right. And I think we do want to avoid resentment, but I think the Stoics offer us other resources. I don't know. This is, I, I, for me, all this is kind of still a work in progress. Um, I won't claim to have like some sort of harmonious everything living together in my head and heart perfectly well. Um, I just, you know, I'm a pluralist in, in philosophy or an eclectic, if you like, and I draw upon what works for me and, and bring to bear what works for my clients as well. All right, Brittany has a clarification. To clarify my previous question on clemency, Seneca says forgiveness comes from a place of anger and unequal authority, whereas mercy comes from a place of compassion and equitable treatment. He said something around forgiveness being an added action while there's mercy is inaction and Stoics don't do additional actions. Okay, well, there, there you go. He's using these in very precise ways that make sense within his framework. Um, I wouldn't try to extend that uh, outside of a Stoic framework 
and say, well, you know, see what the Christians say about this or the Aristotelians say about this because they're working with a different psychology in that case. Um, what else do we have? Um, Lasher asks, what's your favorite Stoic quote? I don't actually have one. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a good person to ask about favorites because I, I never know. <laughs> I don't know what my favorite band is. I don't know who my favorite philosopher is. You know, I, I guess you could say my favorite Stoic quote is whatever I happen to, you know, find helpful for me when I get into a shitty situation and have to figure out how to respond appropriately, you know, then I'm happy to have that quote ready at hand. But I'm, I'm not a big, like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like Seneca. He's got this great letter, was letter 33, I think. And his buddy uh, Lucilius is saying, hey, man, give me some quotes, right? Uh, he's asking for the, you know, some passages. And Seneca says, how the hell am I going to pick? You know, they're all good. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many good ones in here and they don't, they don't stand out above each other because they're, they're all on the same level. You know, stoicism is a complex system. And then, then afterwards, of course, Seneca says, well, I guess I'll give you some. So <laughs> typical Seneca. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of back and forth about the, um, different political things. Um, Anastasia, would you can personally consider stoicism an active life affirming philosophy? I think Nietzsche's main problem with it was considering it primarily the philosophy of indifference. Yeah. I think Nietzsche got stoicism wrong, probably in part because most people around him were getting stoicism wrong. That was a common thing in the 19th century. Um, actually in the 18th century as well. Um, cause Hume also gets stoicism wrong. And, um, I think there were a lot of people who were behaving in the way that Nietzsche is criticizing the Stoics as, as behaving. But would I consider stoicism an active life affirming philosophy? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it certainly is in, in the classic Stoics. Epictetus is life affirming, you know, Seneca's life affirming people. Well, why do you commit suicide then? Well, you know, that's because Nero would have, if he hadn't committed suicide, Nero would have confiscated everything and his family would have been, you know, if not killed, uh, certainly in, in terrible condition, um, you know, so and, uh, he only killed himself once, whereas he behaved like a stoic pretty much for, you know, time after time after time. So, yeah. Um, James L. Dr. Sadler to play devil, play devil's advocate. Why should we create justice in a fundamentally unjust world? It seems like a uniquely human concept. Yeah, that's exactly it. Why shouldn't we create justice then? Why shouldn't we express what humanity is? W who says that if the world is shitty, that we have to leave it shitty? I mean, do you do that at campsites? You, you know, you go and you're like, well, I mean, everybody's going to screw it up anyway. So I'm just going to like, throw my crap around everywhere and, you know, I'm not going to clean up after myself. No, you, you try to leave things in a better condition. Um, that's, that's part of what makes us human. Um, and, you know, I mean, the Stoics didn't think that justice was a uniquely human concept, but they, they also thought that rational beings uh, uh, existed beyond the, the realm of the human, right? So... Um, oops, just jumped again. Let's see what we've got here. Um, let's see here. Ah, da Daniel asked, do you think there are any undisciplined Stoics? Yeah, because uh, Stoics don't claim to be gods or totally impeccable or in, you know, you... you you start in in, in uh, any virtue ethics, you're going to screw up a lot at the start, and you're probably going to keep on screwing up too, you know. And then you get some things worked out, and then you're like, "Oh man, this part of my life I've I've more or less fixed, but now I see how screwed up this other part is." You know, that's natural, um, and that goes for any virtue ethics. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, that's uh, I think that's kind of common. James says this theme of discipline is fascinating for the Stoics. It seems Nietzsche has extended this to its conclusion. 
is discipline a necessary ingredient to fruitful philosophy? Yeah, pr I mean, pretty much, um, pretty much anything that you're going to try to develop, you you have to have some discipline with it. Even like getting yourself to the gym takes discipline, and then you know, actually doing the stuff at the gym or you know, learning an instrument. Um, you know, everything takes discipline to some degree, I guess. Um, sometimes even enjoying yourself in the right way takes a little bit of disciplining. So, all right. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Peter says, thank you very much for your discussion of justice. I'm sometimes stoically bothered by online stoics who criticize pro-justice stoics and have an individualistic internal view of stoicism. Yeah, I'd say they're not they, they're not understanding stoicism adequately and they're reading very selectively and they're probably doing so so they can you know appeal to their own emotional need for security. You, you know, you ask yourself why do why do people have this very individualistic conception of stoicism as like it's insulation against the world. Um, it's uh, you know actually Margaret Graver by the way, um, and you can find this in Stoicism today. If you just go to modernstoicism.com and, you know, in the search thing, put in Graver. She gave a really, really good talk at a couple, uh, a couple of Stoicons ago, the one in Toronto, uh, two, two years ago, three years ago, three years ago, um, where she was distinguishing Epicurean, Cynic, and Stoic approaches to things, to, to emotions. And she said, the cynics are trying to develop a hard outer shell. Um, the Stoics are not. The Stoics are trying to become resilient. And genuine resiliency would be engaging with your fellow human being. The Stoics think that we're social beings as rational beings. So if we're individualistic, there's, there's, there's something wrong with that Stoicism. It's not authentically Stoic. Um, all right. Uh, uh, here's a good one um, from Lasher. An advice Marcus Aurelius gave when it comes to confronting somebody's behavior it should, it should be done privately and not publicly. Is it possible that this idea came because of the fact that Socrates got killed since so, so many disliked him due to losing arguments? Probably not. Um, it's probably more that you know, Marcus didn't have to worry about anyone killing him other than, you know, in, in war. Um, he was the emperor. So he's not going to he's not going to have that going on. And people more or less liked him. He was one of the, the he was the last good emperor. Right. And um, so, you, you know, I think with Marcus, it would be more. Listen, why should we put somebody on the spot and embarrass them? Why not take them aside and talk to them privately, which is often good advice, you know, uh, in the workplace or things like that. All right, I'm going to have to get going pretty soon because my soon I'm going to have to hit, it, hit the shower and get dressed because my wife is going to be back and we're supposed to do some sort of event in town, some sort of tasting thing. Um, I think Taste of Milwaukee or something like that, which, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. So my wife r rightly recognized that these things are frustrating for me. We go around and there's all these little tiny bits of food, right? And and you, you they're all basically a mousse bouche, right? In in uh, culinary terms, and you, so you take a little bit of that and then like you know sip a little bit of beer. Basically, everything's in thimbles, <laughs> you know. It, it, you you never get enough um, when you do these sorts of things. I think little twig like people who are five feet tall. Um, probably yes, but a six foot three guy, no, you know, um, and you don't want to ask for like extra portions cause then you look like a pig or something. Right. So, all right, back to, uh, this, though. so I, I don't know how many questions, I'll, long story short, I don't know how many of the, of the questions I'll actually, um, have. So let's see here. Um, old rustic house. How do I apply stoicism to life after work? where I read and think and solve problems all day. I get so tired and feel the urge to veg out, but know there's more fruitful activities. Okay, well, you probably do need to, to veg out if you're working and, and you know exercising your mind all day. 
Um, what about, you know, pro, you know, programming into your day, like half an hour, you don't have to like be, be like Machiavelli, right. Who would do his day job as an administrator of Florence and then go to his home and take off his work clothes and put on his robes and go into his study and commune with Livy and the ancients all night, you know, uh, a lot of us have to do, you know, jobs that are quite draining. If you can make, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour for yourself to do a little bit of reading and um, some, maybe some guided meditation or something like that, it'll, it'll help you. Um, and then, you know, you can also, you can also, um, in, in, you know, like on your way to work or something like that, maybe listen to a podcast or, um, you know, you could, you can break up your day with, with some stuff. You don't have to try to do everything all at once. So, all right. Uh, do, do, do. Matthias says, aren't the Platonic philosophers, the true inheritance of philo philosophia? What is the doctrine of Stoics on the one? What oh, Zeus. <laughs> Right, so it's the logos that runs through everything. Um, by the way, plenty of Neoplatonists um, picked up stuff from the Stoics, just like they did with the Aristotelians. They thought, well, we need Plato for like the high up stuff, and then got to have something else for the the intramundane level. Um, I've just been actually working through Simplicius's commentary on um, uh Epictetus's and Caridian. Very interesting stuff to see how they blend these things together. So, all right. Um, let's see if there's any others I can go out on. Um, okay, so here's some, a good one. Something you said, you can practice Stoicism all you want. You still have a breaking point. You still have a threshold of tolerance. Just don't overestimate Stoicism's potential like anything else. It has its limits. Yeah, and actually I would say you have your limits. I mean, if you think that some sort of ism is going to like fix your life altogether, eh, you're, you're setting yourself up for problems. Genuine Stoicism would be something that would be reflexive. It would take stock of itself every once in a while. I mean, you notice that Epictetus doesn't just, in his teachings, doesn't just say, uh, it's already been talked about in Chrysippus. I don't have to think about this at all. You know, just read the book, right? And he adds to it. He's he's continually reinterpreting Stoicism, and that's how it it adapts itself. And that's that's why I think modern Stoicism is, um, you know, in some respects, the the more superior strain than traditional Stoicism. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. Um, Everybody does have a, a breaking point. Um, now, the Stoicism would say your breaking point can be a lot further along than you think it is, and you can certainly do things to make yourself less affected by stuff, but yeah. Um, all right, so that's that's probably a good one to go out on. Um, I'm already like 12 minutes, uh, 13 minutes over what I was originally planning. Thanks for all of your questions and comments. I'm glad you could be here. Um, I'm going to do another pop-up later on this month. Probably will not be about <clears throat> um, stoicism or virtue ethics as such. I'm thinking that the next pop-up, uh, I might, you know, I might do like one like this each month on, on either on stoicism or Aristotelianism or something along those lines, something in virtue ethics. Um, but I'm thinking, I, I kind of feel like, you know, I, I should do something uh, that I would like to do that I don't get to do, because I do like to do this, but I don't get to do all that often, which is to talk about classic metal. So I think I might um, make the next uh, pop-up later on this month be about that, but we'll, we'll see how, how that works out. So have a, for me, it's, it's night. Um, have a good, whatever it is for you, evening, morning, uh, afternoon, night, so, and I'll see you probably um, next big online event we have is the AMA. So I'll see you then.